I'm Renee Ritchie, and in the last video, I broke down all the rumors that had come out all of last week. I have not had time to read the article yet, so what I figured I would do is just go through this in real time with you and react to it and just give you my honest impressions, uh, except for the MacBook rumors, which a lot of you pointed out to me fairly quickly. So I'm gonna go through those right now. Sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, so early last week, China Times put out a story on the upcoming Apple Silicon Macs. Now, China Times isn't included on Apple Track, at least not yet. That's the website that I've been using to create these tier lists for the reliability of the various rumor sources in the Apple community. Uh, so I'm just gonna stick them at C tier uh, for now. An argument could be made maybe for B tier, maybe even for D tier. So let me know what you think in the comments below, but I'm gonna stick with sort of middling reliability for now. But according to the China Times, and they're basing this on supply chain uh, rumors, which means the manufacturing that's going on in China and also the sourcing for the different parts that go into the devices being manufactured, that Apple is working on a new 12 inch retina display MacBook, very similar uh, in all likelihood to the 12 inch MacBook they originally launched with Intel's Core M series back in 2015, but this time using custom Apple silicon. They claim the battery will last up to 15 to 20 hours and it'll use an A1410 processor and it's gonna stick with the USB type C interface. So let's break all of this down. What made the 12 inch MacBook so interesting was that it used a lot of uh, back then cutting edge technologies, things like the force touch trackpad and things like terraced battery so they could fit as much battery as possible into the very small blade shaped chassis of the MacBook. And it had only a single USB-C port. The joke Apple made at the time was that they didn't want to include any ports on it. It was meant for a truly wireless age but you still had to have a one port for power. And that since you had to have one port, it might as well be as multifunctional a port as possible. And it was one of the first devices, if not the first device to use USB-C, which allowed it to do power delivery as well as data transfer. And so it had that one port to rule them all. Although one would hope it'd be upgraded to USB 4 and if not Thunderbolt 3, all the way to Thunderbolt 4 at this point. As to the A14X, that assumes that Apple is doing the A14 this year for the iPhone, which is one of the safest assumptions to make in the business, but that they're also gonna do an A14X variant for uh, which would normally go into an iPad Pro. The X means extra graphics cores, extra GPUs. So instead of you know four, you have seven or eight of those in, in, from a, an iPhone to an iPad. But the promise of Mac Silicon is that it's purpose built for the Mac. They're not just using Apple iOS Silicon, iPhone or iPad Silicon and putting it into the Mac. And I realized the developer kit does exactly that. It takes the A12Z, the sort of better binned version of the A12X from the 2018 iPad Pro, the same chip that's in the current 2020 iPad Pro and puts that in a Mac mini enclosure for developers to test against. But I, I'd always just felt that that was so that we wouldn't see the actual Mac silicon. So what I'm hoping they mean here is an A14X variant because I think Mac has different requirements for its silicon. It's a different client of Apple's uh, silicon team, the one led by Johnny Saruji, who said just as recently as this June when it was announced that they'd be making a family of SOCs for the Mac, not just reusing um, iPad silicon for the Mac. Now, maybe you can make an argument that a 12 inch MacBook is such an iPad-like device that it really is an iPad in Mac clothing that if any Mac was gonna just reuse iPad silicon, it would be the 12 inch Mac. But I think even there, the tasks that are required of a Mac are different enough that the silicon should still be different. One of the things we've talked about before is just hypervisor acceleration, for example. You're gonna be running virtual machines on a Mac. Uh, basically, it, take anything, any feature of the Mac figure out a way to accelerate that in silicon with custom accelerator blocks, next leveling, all of that. And as to 15 to 20 hours of uh, battery life, uh, that makes the kind of sense that does because Apple right now is putting out just so much more efficient chips 
the original MacBook 12-inch uh, was based on the Core M series from Intel, which I never liked. You, you could see it. You could put it right next to the iPad Pro, the original iPad Pro that was announced just later the same year, 2015, and it would... It would do like three streams of 4K video while the Core M3 and I think maybe the Core M5 would suffer under trying to do even one stream. And the idea of having something as powerful as Apple Silicon with the kind of efficiency that it also brings, just boosting that battery life up to 15 to 20 hours, not under high level load, obviously, but under regular and light loads, uh, That that's just again, the promise of Apple Silicon. The one part that's not in the China Times article, but has been rumored as well, is the return of butterfly keyboards. Now, Apple was sort of specific when they announced the new Magic Keyboards on the latest generation MacBook Pro and later the MacBook Air. They didn't sort of say that they were ending the butterfly keyboard, that sort of it was something that they were still interested in. And maybe, again, that makes sense for a device as thin as a 12-inch MacBook. That's the reason it was developed by Apple to begin with, but it just, it never proved reliable. And you could argue whether the incident rates were ever as high as some of the other things that Apple has uh, has had to deal with over the years, be they display issues or graphic issues or, or whatever. But the the sentiment around it on social media, in, in general media, it just kept getting higher and higher and higher. And Apple tried fixing it. There was a second generation, a third generation. They put membranes in. And it did, it worked to some extent. The failure rates went down and down every year, but the sentiment didn't change. And it's hard to see anyone just accepting a butterfly keyboard anymore, not without Apple putting the same sorts of extended warranties in place immediately on launch that they were doing to sort of take the, the anxiety out of people buying the last couple generations of butterfly keyboards. And yes, there's a redemptive arc here where some engineers inside Apple probably want an opportunity to say, see, we were right about this keyboard. We can make it every bit as reliable as the Magic Keyboard. We just need one more shot at it. And I just don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's worth putting Apple customers through that level of uncertainty again, given everything that's happened so far just to sort of prove that you were right about this keyboard. And even if it makes a 12 inch MacBook a millimeter or more thicker, I think that's a trade off most people would make at this point. And I see a lot of people say the whole thing was overblown. I never had a problem. I actually like this keyboard better. And I think that's fine. But regardless of how you feel, nobody hated those older scissor switch keyboards and nobody seems to hate these new Magic Keyboards. And a large and vocal segment of Apple's customer base just really, really despises um, the butterfly keyboards. And the Mac only has one vendor. It's not like if you hate Apple's version of the Mac, you can go buy the Dell or HP version of the Mac. So I think it would behoove Apple to sort of keep all of that in the back of their minds and just let the butterfly keyboard rest in peace, like DED dead, and move on with a, a glorious new magic keyboard uh, destiny for all of us. The other part of the China Times report that was really interesting concerned not the MacBook, but the iMac, saying that Apple was working on not just the new CPUs, but the new GPUs. And that's been a really open question because for something like a 12 inch MacBook, you can just take iPad Pro level performance. And I think a lot of people would be happy having that. But the concern, uh, the curiosity has been, how does Apple scale up the iPad Pro uh, or 12 inch MacBook style performance all the way up to their desktops, you know, including things like the iMac. And how do they scale up competing with internal embedded Intel GPUs with the discrete GPUs they've been using from AMD, especially right now when NVIDIA has just announced Ampere, which looks like it blows the lids off their previous performance levels. And AMD is on the cusp of announcing Navi 2, Big Navi, which uh, by a lot of accounts is gonna be competitive for the first time in years with what NVIDIA is offering. And how does Apple compete with that? One of the advantages they have is Apple basically funds Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, TSMC's processes. And so Apple gets first cut at them. 
So the very first things to come off those processes, as soon as the yield rates are good enough, are Apple products. So the iPhone was the first thing on the seven nanometer process, and it's expected to be the first thing on the five nanometer process. And there's a school of thought that Nvidia is having to go with Samsung's eight nanometer process for Ampere because Apple has just bought out all of TSMC's five nanometer process, including for their new Apple Silicon and their new GPUs. So at least on one level, Apple will have a process, like, like a die size advantage. They'll be at five nanometers when others are at seven or at eight nanometers. Another potential advantage is that Apple is using tile-based deferred rendering as opposed to tile-based immediate mode renderers, uh, which are supposed to be more efficient if um, more difficult to implement. So if Apple gets the implementation right, that could be an advantage as well. And Apple is currently working at six watts where I forget the exact amount that, what's Nvidia working at, 300 watts? Like, like 300 watts at their top end lines. So as Apple uh, ramps up the power on these chips, maybe not to the molten lava-esque levels of an Nvidia, uh, they'll get commensurate, uh, commensurately better performance from these as well. Now the article says that Apple has an A14 Sicilian, an A14X Tonga, and an Apple GPU Lefuca. They're working on this, and I guess the big test of all this will be just how much performance they get out of these chips for an iMac, because the 12-inch MacBook is still competing with Intel Y-series and embedded. And even the 13-inch MacBook Pro, it's still only competing there with embedded graphics as well, which is maybe an easier target for the first systems that come out. But with the iMac, it's gonna be competing with the Intel one that Apple just announced which has the latest Intel chipset. You know, it has the 10th generation chipset in it and not Navi 2, but it has Navi 1 and AMD graphics, which I think betrays a certain level of confidence from the Apple Silicon team because that's a much higher benchmark uh, for them to compete with than if they had just left the old iMac on the market one more year or so. I'm okay with that because it turns out you can actually put a number on how much you don't know. And when you learn something new, you can change your beliefs about what you know. There's even a formula for it. And Brilliant will teach you the cutting edge mathematics that you need for it, like information theory, Bayesian networks, and causal inference. And in an accessible way, without calculations getting in the way, just an emphasis on applying these ideas to deal with the uncertainty in all of our lives right now. Brilliant's a website and app with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science, logic and deduction, physics, quantum mechanics, game theory, cryptocurrency, and so much more. The courses are laid out like a story and broken down into pieces so that you can tackle them just a little bit at a time. And there are no tests, no grades. Just pick a course based on what you're interested in and get started. And if you make a mistake, who cares? Just check out the explanations to learn more. Go to brilliant.org slash Renee Ritchie and sign up for free. Just click on the link in the description or go to brilliant.org slash Renee Ritchie. And the first 200 of you can also level up with 20% off the annual premium subscription. And clicking on the link really helps out the channel. For much more on Apple Silicon Macs, just check out the playlist above. I break down every possible Apple Silicon Mac and what we can expect from each and every one of them. Just click the playlist above and I'll see you next video.